if something just like the rocket shipping to the moon, you, you don't want to jump off the rocket ship. You, <laughs> you want to go to the moon, you know? So it, it, it's, 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 it's like an emotional thing that, that people do, but I feel like it's the incorrect way to, to approach investing in crypto. What's up, everybody? Today we've got a good friend of Doug Polk's who's played high stakes. He's played 200, 400. Uh, no Limit Hold'em, he's won millions of dollars in No Limit Hold'em and went on to make millions more and has been a major success in the crypto community. Perhaps the most successful, in fact, of the poker players in crypto and has gone on to form a, uh, a big career in venture capital and is also uh, a trader as well and is not afraid to speak his mind jason mo what's going on hey jungle how's it going uh, i'm doing good uh not too much you sound so modest because um well we'll get to it in a little bit but one of the biggest things i remember you for is like actually speaking out against people being pieces of shit in the poker world, which is really rare. Most people do quite the opposite and have are quite spineless and um, are just like kind of idiots when it comes to people being uh, doing shitty things. Um, but yeah, why don't you tell us a bit about uh, your poker story, like where you came from, how you got into it. Um, you know, raising up, rising up from the stakes. Uh, yeah. So I started playing. Um, I think my freshman year of college. Um, or I guess the end of my freshman year. Um, I, I had an internship over the summer, um, and one of my internship coworkers was a poker player at the time. Um, and a few of my like good high school friends were like really good poker players at the time, and they they started poker uh, a little bit before me. Um, so then uh, that summer, I, I basically learned how to play poker. I started out with maybe like a couple hundred dollar bankroll. Um, I read every thread on 2 plus 2, uh, basically when 2 plus 2 was a pretty high value in terms of the, the content for a strategy. So like I basically learned to play um, like small to mid stakes, uh, no limit, m mostly six max, some full ring, some short handed. Um, but by like studying there, studying, um, I, I was pretty active. I think at the inception of Lego Poker, that was the um, that was like a really old training site. Um, I'm trying to think of who were the, like the old coaches there. Like, I remember like Sauce was a coach, uh, Aaron Jones, Lucky Chewy, th those guys. Um, th this was like 2000. I want to say 2010 to 2009, somewhere around there. Um, so then I started mm -hmm. playing, um, just grinding my way up stakes um, after college. I basically didn't get a job and I started playing full time because I was making at, at that point I was probably making like low uh, six figures a year. Um, and then uh, eventually I, I met like guys like Doug, Ryan Fee, um, a, a, a bunch of other like good poker players. Um, started playing a lot of heads up, we'll learn from them. Um, and then throughout the years, I focused mostly on heads up, no limit. I got to pretty high stakes. Like I was playing. It would basically anyone that would play up to 25, 50, 50, 100. Um, and then I basically did that. I, I played a decent amount of, of six max, um, mostly 10, 20, 25, 50, mm -hmm. one stars, full tilt, um, some of the other sites. Uh, but played a decent amount in Macau. And then like around 2000, I want to say 2016, I like decided I didn't really want to continue playing poker anymore. The games were getting tougher. I was getting a bit burnt out and bored a bit, um, so then I so slowly like s stopped really working as hard and like a, a, it, I guess it was like a bit of a process. But like within like a year and a half, I I went from playing basically every day to not playing much at all. What was it um, that was? Uh, well, do you want to talk about what burnt you out a little bit with poker? And what was it that appealed to you about crypto? Was poker ever was that something you're really passionate about in the beginning? Did something change? And um, like, was there something special about crypto beyond just the money that really interested you? 
Uh, yeah, so with regards to poker, um, I, I've always been a pretty hardcore gamer. Like even before I was playing poker, I, was, I, I played a ton of games when I was younger. So I was always pretty competitive mm -hmm. like on the gaming side. Um, I guess what burnt me out is a, a few things. I guess like the repetition of everything. Um, basically, I'd been playing the, uh, the, the same game um, for between like eight to ten years. Um, and, and the other thing was like people were getting a bit better, but then also like the 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 money from the the weaker players was drying up a bit, so I was getting a lot less heads up action. Um, even before I wasn't getting that much heads up action, but I would still have enough action every day where I could play. Like if if I didn't have games at like the higher stakes, I could grind out like five, ten, ten, twenty against like reasonable regs that would play you know, two to four tables and, and I can get like the thousands of hands in. Whereas uh, eventually that like heads up landscape sort of dried out a bit where now I, I feel like it's non-existent. Like no one really plays each other heads up online anymore. It, it, it's not like the way it used to be. And I didn't really mm -hmm. want to play live poker. I never enjoyed live poker that much. Um, you get like very few hands per hour. Um, I mean, I play a decent amount of live poker, like so some pretty big games and it, it was it was profitable or um like the if i continue be, being a pro and just playing live I, i'm sure i, I could have done fine but it, it, it's not exactly like i didn't want to be in a casino for like 10 plus hours every day so i guess there's a more of a, a lifestyle thing as well where um i i just wanted to like a change of pace and to do something else um oh, with sure. regards to crypto uh, so I initially got into crypto, um, I want to say around 2000, 2011, uh, it, it basically as a way to, so, so at that point I was playing on um, a decent number of non-major poker sites. So like I guess the, the major ones would be at the time were like Poker Stars, Full Tilt Poker, Ultimate Bet, Party Poker. Um, but there was decent action on, on other sites like uh, I forgot the name of them. Um, I don't even remember the the, the name the names of them. I'm, I'm not even sure if they exist anymore. Uh, but so um, I think it was like 2000, 2009, 2010. UIGEA passed, which basically outlawed uh, Americans from playing uh, poker within the United States on online regulated sites. And uh, the bigger problem for me was even if I moved out of the country and I was playing um, online. Uh, I'm still like an American citizen and I, I had an American bank accounts and it was difficult to f find a site that would um, like uh, eventually I wanted to get money back to my US bank, bank account and like buy stuff, pay taxes, whatever. And it, it, it was it was difficult moving money around through the traditional like Skrill, um, money bookers or whatever it was back then uh, to your American bank account. So then I, I got into crypto as a sort of out of necessity so as a way to transact money. Um, you, you know what's funny, the, uh, this, was, this was 2000, man, I wanna say it was like 2013, but you and I, we went to the Philippines together, right? You remember that? Yeah, and, yeah, and I remember we played, the Philippines. <laughs> we, we, were, we were playing like these like cash games and we played like a 25K tournament. And I, I don't know if, if, if we got heads up or uh, maybe, maybe you got third in that tournament. Um, it was like a 25k high roller. It, it got like like 50 runners or something. Maybe even less than 50. I don't um, think it got 50, man. I, I really a little, a little, a little, a little less than 50, right? It, it, I think it, it wasn't. Got it like wasn't uh, five or ten or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. So so um, I ended up winning that tournament, and the the, the casino there didn't pay me out. Um, in oh. USD, they paid me on Filipino peso, and they refused to wire the money to my bank account. And, it, and, I, and I had a flight out of the Philippines the, the basically the next day, and they just gave me like a sack of cash and to, told me good luck basically. So um, I, I, I I messaged these guys that run at the time a crypto exchange called uh, Coins.ph, and their their main like use case at the time was remittance payments so like for example if if you're a filipino in the united states and you have a job and you're making money and you want to send money back to your uh family or relatives the options then at the time were something like western union which would charge like upwards of nine percent vig on like a, a, a transaction which is which is absolutely ridic ridiculous uh, so the, the they were processing 
Yeah. yeah they, 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 they were processing remittance payments uh, th th through crypto and charging a lot less big. So then I reached out to them and was like, yeah, I have all this cash. Like, I, I need to get it out of the Philippines. Uh, can I just buy Bitcoin with it? And they're like, yeah, sure. Uh, you come into our office, which is like, the, I went to their office, but their office was just like a, um, a, a pretty big penthouse in, in one of the uh, the high rises in Makati, which is like the business district of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, and they're they they are basically like, yeah, we can process this, but this is like, basically 30 times our monthly volume in 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 one in, in one go so you're gonna have to like or we're gonna have to process this like week by week so like every week basically they they bought a certain amount of bitcoin sent it to me and then uh, like uh, uh eventually i got on all, all the money so like i think that was that sort of turned my eyes to crypto as um basically a way to transact from person to person um, with, without the limitations of like say the government or you know like r regulations in, in certain areas which was definitely a problem at the time. Yeah that being that was like one of the biggest use cases it's, uh, in the poker world we actually had like that as one of the biggest ways just to like get money to tournaments and things like that. Um, I, uh, I mean, I also understood, I was told basically in many developing countries, like those in Africa, they used uh, Bitcoin a lot to, uh, yeah. to, to send money. I mean, you still need it. Like, yeah. I, I feel like a lot of that is, <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of that is, um, like, uh, there isn't that much infrastructure built in like some of those countries. And then yeah. also a lot of those countries suffer from hyperinflation. So if you're just holding spot uh, the, their native currency, you could be losing like you think inflation is, is bad in the United States. You could be losing 40, 50 percent a year. Um, so uh, it, it's basically the only asset they really have access to that that's a hedge to the the inflation of their natural currency, which is, you know, it, it's it's very appealing to, to a person with, that it accumulates um, a decent amount of wealth in the, in the third world country and attempting to, to preserve their wealth. Yeah, uh, it's like, I mean, the problem with that in third world countries is like, how the f like, they still need like a laptop <laughs> or whatever it is to get money on these, like, you know, places. Uh, the third world countries are really broken, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's like part of a solution, I would say. Like, they, mm -hmm. they need more than that, but that's a bigger subject. I, um, I, I, so, so far, Mm. Well, it sounds like you got into poker for gaming. For crypto, was it mostly the money that interested you, or you were interested in the the tech development side? I remember you like did talk a little bit about this stuff during during the day because like one of the biggest hypes about crypto was that you know this idea like it was the future. It's gonna like you know uh, I'm not like a massive expert in it, but it was gonna like free up like all the centralization issues with money and things like that. Yeah. And then there's all these technological applications that mostly still haven't happened yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as usual, everyone always does this planning fallacy thing, especially in like any kind of business yeah. world. To what extent were you involved in like the visionary side of things, or or whatever, or did you really care about that too much? You just looked for like real projects that were not, you know, too hopeful. That sort, um, that sort of thing. Where did your incentive lie? Um, business wise and well I know business wise you picked good programs um, but uh, did you ever like were you ever like inspired to get in to like focus on like building new technology for the future yeah yeah for lines? sure so like it initially I, I mean okay, crypto has progressed a long way like a very long way so since I first got into it like beyond what I could have imagined at the time so like really? at the time when I got into crypto, there was basically only Bitcoin. Like there are some other coins, but they were they were mostly memes, and they weren't really um, that their their technical basis wasn't really strong. It wasn't until Ethereum came around in in 2015, I believe, that there was like a glimpse into the future of of what we could do hmm. in crypto outside of just sending money back and forth. 
Um, so like when I initially got into crypto, I, I, I wasn't really expecting to, to, to make that much money from it. I mean, I, like I, I thought Bitcoin would go up because the, the fundamentals are, are solid, like it's a fixed supply. Um, it, it, there's a certain amount of emissions mined every year. Compare that to basically any like native fiat currency. Any government can print as much money as, as they want every year, whereas you can't just print more Bitcoin every year. So th that that really resounded with me. Um, and then like, so I, I didn't really do much in, in crypto outside of just like holding Bitcoin up until like 2015, 2016. Um, th th there was a forum c called uh, Bitcoin Talk, which is like the b basically the, the two plus two of, of cryptocurrency. Um, if you remember two plus two back in the day, it was like really good content, really good community. Like yeah. the, you would have like real high stakes crushers, like posting strategy, to talking about real things. And then now, I, I mean, I haven't been on in a while, but I assume it's like it, it's kind of dead and there isn't that much good content put out there. But 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 at the time, like I would just browse Bitcoin talk every day. Um, but people would like come up with new ideas as to, you know, how, how to use Bitcoin to, to develop, um, to develop certain use cases, developing exchanges. And then um, when Ethereum came around, uh, Vitalik, who is the founder of Ethereum, uh, the, the, there's a there's a sub forum on Bitcoin talk called uh, AMM, which is uh, basically for for new projects. And Vitalik wrote like a very long post about how, like the, the issue with Bitcoin and the, the issue of cryptocurrency it, is that it, it hasn't developed any other use cases. It, it hasn't developed any other functionality uh, outside of just a, a, a transfer of access. And he wanted to build a project that would be able to scale. Like he called it a global computer. It basically, they'll, it's like a, a, a decentralized smart contract platform where, where people can do whatever the, the, they can imagine on chain. So this is like 2015. Um, so then I, I, I got into Ethereum uh, like the the Ethereum community uh, quite a bit. I, I talked with a bunch of people with with the uh, Ethereum. Um, actually, um, so one of my good friends, uh, Oli, he he was an ex poker player too. Um, his, his screen name online, you know, his, his screen screen name online was Kotkus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he, I know. he he was the he was the one who uh, basically. Th this is even before Ethereum was a thing. He he sent me the link to the Bitcoin Talk post and and said like this is super interesting, uh, you should read through it. And th that's basically how, how I got into it. And then like, this is this is like around 2015. Um, 2000 like end of 2016, early 2017 is when like Ethereum ecosystem stuff really took off. Um, the, I, I guess w people would remember it as the the first like real bull run. Where we went from, I want to say like three thousand dollar Bitcoin to twenty thousand dollar Bitcoin, but th there was like a ton of projects being developed on Ethereum. A lot of them were kind of garbage, but the the, the reason why they're being developed is because something called the ERC twenty standard was developed on Ethereum, meaning like you could issue your own token on Ethereum, and then there was all these projects that are building their own token. You could trade your own token. Um, the the whole ICO. Boom, ICO, meaning uh, initial coin offering. Uh, but basically, you can develop a project, issue a token, and sell it as a fundraising mechanism to uh, um, take only crypto and not have to go through like the seed round or the Series A let th that traditional finance has. So there was like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, pr projects that um, ha had had an idea or attempted to raise funds. And the, the, the market was booming in a way where even if the ideas weren't necessarily good um, or long-term viable, you could still, if you get it in early enough, you can invest and then you'd find some excellent liquidity. So you, even if eventually the project was gonna fail, you'd be able to, to sell your tokens at like a higher rate. So um, it, it became a, a pretty profitable at that point. Um, but the, the other thing that interested me at that point where like out of all the, the garbage being uh, released, the, the, there were some like very interesting projects that that used the Ethereum blockchain, used smart uh, contract technology, I, I, in order to d develop something on chain that, that hasn't been done before. So, like for example, a project like Augur, 
which is um, it, it, it failed. Just I feel like it was too early to the market, but it was basically a, a decentralized betting platform or a decentralized prediction market platform. So like y you could set up markets as to like who the next president will be. Will there be World War Two? Like is oh, really? is 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 uh, is, is, uh, is Trump going to be um, indicted or, or not indicted? This stuff like that. And then all, all this, all the verification can be done, done on chain. So like, um, it, the, the the idea is that it would re replace like the the centralized uh, sp sports books and also stuff like Betfair, which is basically a centralized sports book, but it's still peer to peer. Like your counterparty isn't the sports book; it's the other people betting on the site. Um, but like, it, it sort of died down just because like there weren't enough people using crypto, especially using Ethereum at the time. That wanted to to use these markets, but now like we're in a, a another a cycle where we we've onboarded like millions and millions of m more people into crypto. So uh, uh, like I, I think the last like year and a half, we've maybe like the, the last two and a half years, I'd say, we, we we've seen actual like real development um, in cryptocurrency and like actual use cases being developed and actually used on chain. Uh, um, I could see how definitely at certain stages, certain projects could um, it just not be the right time. It's too bad. That that does seem like a decent idea. Uh, I mean, maybe even these sports book places do have a bit of a monopoly. I, I don't know if they have a monopoly or not, to be honest, on um, on betting. But I do understand it's like extremely hard to make money from betting. Uh, but have there have been many use cases that actually have developed since because I keep hearing there's still not really that many. Um, it, it depends on who you ask and what you think like a reasonable use case is. In my opinion, there are quite a few. Um, so like the, the whole smart contract platform um, allows you, so, so if, for example, uh, the idea of a stable coin, uh, like a, a coin that trades at a dollar that, that is backed by something that is at l worth at, at least a dollar, uh, allows f for a lot of markets to exist. Because like the, the, the issue before, um, before stable coins existed, it was you can't really have markets because you could basically only trade crypto against other cryptocurrency if you did it off a centralized exchange. Whereas, like, if you, develop, uh, if you develop a coin that represents a, a U.S. dollar or even, like, a euro or, or whatever on, on chain, it, it allows, like, a, quite a few, few markets to exist. So initially, it was just, like, automated market maker. You would, you would have, um, like, a, a pool of assets, uh, usually two assets, and then just, like, a market you could trade back and forth. So let's just say Ethereum U.S. dollar or Bitcoin U.S. dollar. And now they're, they're, they're developing quite a few interesting things that they're, they're developing perpetual futures um, that they're they're developing leverage trading the, the whole decentralized finance thing basically um, like uh, for, for example if, if you if you trade on a centralized exchange you, you pay fees and the fees go to the the centralized exchange so if you trade on something like a binance or coinbase you, you pay a fee for every trade that the trade goes to the company. That's the company's business model. That's how they make money. But like the the, the new model of um, on-chain exchanges is the liquidity providers. Basically, that the people providing um, both sides of the trade to whoever wants are are basically the the, the exchange. So that they any fees, in theory, get paid to them um, instead of the the exchange. The, the the other thing that I I found kind of interesting that happened in like the past like year and a half two years is synthetic uh, synthetic assets so like the the, the um i i guess like to, to preface this uh synthetic assets are only possible because projects like Chainlink, uh band protocol uh provide on-chain oracles and, and and what an oracle is is it's a price feed that spits the data out on on chain so for, for example if 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 i if i wanted to buy tesla stock Normally, I would have to put uh, wire money to my brokerage, um, buy Tesla stock there. But but now that they're developing solutions, where because all the Tesla pricing data can be transferred for on chain, you can buy and sell in theory Tesla stocks. And like usually, the way it works is because you don't actually own a share of Tesla. The way it works is 
y you mint a share, meaning like you collateralize a share. So let, let's say like a share of a stock is $100. You, you, you lock up $150, you can mint one share and y you can actively tr tr trade that share. However, if, if the price goes up to say like $140 or something like that, th there needs to be some buffer for liquidation. So, so it, it basically if your collateral that doesn't cover the share of the stock price, you need to add more collateral or you get liquidated and you, you, you lose your deposit. So th this model sort of ensures that the, the synthetic assets, the, the stocks that, that are traded on chain, are the same value as the the stocks that you trade on brokerage. So like, I, I feel like it's still it's in its infancy right now, but uh, I feel like th that that's a pretty big use case that's being developed. Or I mean, it, it, the, 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 there are synthetic assets on chain right now, but like, uh, I, I feel like the next five to ten years, it's going to be like pretty common to be buying, trading, investing in stocks on chain without actually holding the stock itself. Oh, that's really interesting. That sounds like a major use case. Um, I didn't even know that was an issue, actually. Uh, that reminds me a bit of uh, something that's quite, I mean, I've heard a bit about it and it seemed like a decent idea, but buying like gold backed, um, mm -hmm. I mean, none of the stuff I understand is like really, like really, um, really insured, uh, or I, what is the word? Um, there's some issue with it basically, but big, but it just like gold ETFs. Yeah. Well, um, gold backed. Is, uh, the uh, the, the issue with gold ETFs is they're not actually backed by gold. Like if y y you can't redeem, it, it tracks the price of gold basically. But mm -hmm. like, I guess it depends on ETF to ETF. I mean, basically, if you invest in gold, like in your brokerage account, you're not really buying gold. You're buying an ETF that like tracks gold and may be partially backed by gold. And the, the, like, I think gold's a pretty example, but because like, uh, so so Tether, the the Bitfinex people, the, the, the they they established the, the the biggest stable coin in use today. It's called uh, Tether USDT. Um, the, it's probably like 80 billion right now in circulation. But they also have a product called, um, I think it's called X A. XAUT or something like that, which is basically the same thing as USDT but for gold. So like instead of ha like the what uh, a coin being uh, it be backed by one dollar, it's actually backed by like a certain amount of gold. So like it, it already exists right now that that if you wanted exposure to gold, you could buy this quote unquote gold stable coin on chain and be the equivalent of buying a gold a gold backed ATF or ETF in theory. Yeah, I did not know that. Uh, but I did. Yeah, the fact that it's not really insured kind of doesn't really solve the problem in my eyes. I mean, yeah, from my perspective, it looks like the world is just like in going in like this mass massive like high volatility situation where it's like, holy shit, what the hell is going to happen in the next like 10 years? Mm -hmm. And it just seems like I mean, from my understanding, uh, I've heard that the crypto market was like kind of messed up for a while. Um, the NFT market was, or still is, and mm -hmm. gold started to seem a lot more attractive, basically, for all these kinds of reasons. Is that something you mess with? Am I right about the current state of the crypto markets? Is this something poker players should be looking at? Uh, what do you mean by that messed up? Well, um, let's just say the market like somewhat crashed. That's all. Yeah, uh, I don't think crypto yeah. is doing that badly though. Yeah, I, I mean it, it's all relative, depending on the the time frame that you're looking at. I mean, you, you got to rem remember that like Ethereum was trading under a hundred dollars only a few years ago, and now it's like uh, it, it's around two thousand dollars. Bitcoin was down at three thousand dollars like um, a few years ago as well. And, and then now it's upwards of thirty thousand dollars, but like the yeah obviously from the highs like Bitcoin hit almost seventy thousand dollars, Ethereum was almost five thousand dollars. So like we're we're maybe like fifty sixty percent off the 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 absolute peaks of the crypto market. So it, it's all relative, I think. It, it, it's all it's all dependent on uh, on what uh, what time frame you're looking at. So like uh, I guess in the past, if you look at the past like year and a half, like crypto has been on. Uh, quite a downswing, but if you like zoom out like another uh, year or so, um, you got to remember that the 
the, the latest bull run ran Bitcoin up from like ten thousand dollars to almost seventy thousand dollars. So uh, yeah, it, it's it's yeah again it, it's all, it's all relative based on what you're looking at. Uh, okay, um, I mean I do think actually that's a better way of looking at things. I do think people are like really caught up in the short term, an awful lot. I mean same as in poker really. Um, people would like it's very easy especially in poker to have this idea of just thinking you're playing really well but actually you're just like running to a bunch of good situations and just like situationally running really good you know mm -hmm. unless you're looking at like really massive samples it's like very easy to be diluted um yeah. and yeah i mean thinking about it, as you said it's sort of like well you're basically still on like the upswing from like mm -hmm. a few years ago it's like a natural swing to swing in this kind of market for these kinds of sizes, I guess. Yeah. I, I feel like that's one of the reasons why I, I didn't like po live poker as much because when I was playing live poker, I was playing like very, very big. And mm -hmm. like you're, you don't get a good sample because you're not playing that many hands an hour. And then also like you play a range of stakes. So if you're playing a lot smaller then suddenly a big game pops up for a few days, like you're your your entire year basically is reliant on you doing well in like a, a, a small time frame and th th that's why I, I enjoyed like online poker a decent amount you just like you grind it out you get like a, a large sample size um it, it may have been less profitable but like it, it felt like it was it was less variance um y you feel more i feel like you feel more control uh, about the outcomes. I mean, if, if you're not doing well, you have like thousands of hands to look at, review, figure out what you're doing wrong. Whereas if you play like a live poker session of like, like 200, 300 hands uh, across like one or two sessions, it, it's difficult to draw any conclusions from that in order to improve and, you know, get back into the game. So e even if you're, you're doing well and you're on the, the wrong side of variance, like sometimes you never know. And then like, if you run into a decent downswing, there's always self-doubt. Even if you're, if you think or you are the best player in the world, if you have like a decent number of, of losing sessions, you you always doubt your abilities and you always second guess what you're doing. Yeah, uh, and by the way, it's easy to draw conclusions, but it's it's not. And people do this all the time. I see it, it's it's hilarious to watch. I mean, from my perspective, but they. Uh, it's it's not easy to draw truthful conclusions. Let's put it yeah. that way. It's very hard yeah. to like see the big picture. Uh, I still I still want to talk a bit about uh, NTFs and investing into gold. Do you have anything to do with that, or what are your thoughts on those big markets? Uh, well, I mean, a a NT, you mean NFTs or NFTs? That's what I meant to say. <laughs> I'm dyslexic a little bit. Yeah. Um... With, with with NFTs, I I don't really I I mean I I, I do a little bit of of, of trading NFTs. Um, it's, it, it's kind of interesting. You talk about the utility base. I I, I don't really believe like long term in, in NFTs. Like the it, it it's it's basically the same as um, you know like all all, all the, the meme stocks uh, going around all all the meme coins. Um, they're they they don't essentially have any value or, or any productive value outside of like the hype and the demand and the community built around them um and and for me uh, i'm i'm generally just not a part of that nor am i good at gauging like uh, like a, a lot of the nft people they they, they get in early at, at certain nfts or, or they, they find good entries um and then like the community takes off a bit and uh, that, that's not really my my skill set so like i don't really dabble much into them um mm -hmm. I, I dabble some in like the the exchanges and the coins like so for example um the the, the biggest exchange for nfts is something called OpenSea, which is uh basically like a a, a centralized exchange and, and they they take a certain amount of fees and now that there are platforms building not only exchanges but um like borrow lend platforms. Uh, so, so for example, if, if you own like an NFT that's worth quite a bit of money, like the, the floor price of the NFT is quite high you, um, and you don't want to sell, but you need liquidity. What you can do is you can deposit your NFT into like one of these sites and then w withdraw like US dollars or Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever against the value of your NFT and use that as a liquidity. And oh, really? the, the, 
the, the, the models are pretty interesting because the, all, the, the, the issue with like all these uh, sites, whether you're de whatever you're depositing as collateral, the, the issue is like, uh, how do we handle liquidations? Meaning, if your collateral isn't, uh, your the value of your collateral goes down in a way where the the loan amount gets close to the the uh, the amount you borrowed, then the the platform needs to figure out how to sell your collateral before the, the, they take a loss, right? Um, and with normal assets, it's pretty easy because the, the, there's like a market for it. But but, but for NFTs, it's it, it's not like that. There's like thousands and thousands of transactions w within like a, a, a single a NFT or, or a group of N NFTs on a daily basis. So like e e like a lot of the bigger NFTs, that the ones worth like let's say like over fifty thousand dollars, like it, 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 they get transacted very very rarely. So it, it's it, it's interesting to see how like all these platforms form and how, how they handle like the liquidation and uh, how, how they handle like how you borrow money against it. So like all, all this stuff interests me a lot more than, than the NFTs themselves. Oh, I mean, I can see how if you could figure that out, um, there could be quite some money in that, I guess, mm -hmm. or at least potentially. It's hard to say from the outset mm -hmm. just because like that is, as you just said, it's a big problem. I mean, like collateralized loans can be like really profitable in other areas, uh, but I mean, here, I mean, I don't know. Um, I mean, there's all yeah. these security risks and things like that too, and whatever, I found that out the hard way. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, thinking about it all, I, I actually, uh, I kind of ended up deciding something like to go really basic with my crypto investing Mm -hmm. um or like find an expert like you and just like trust your opinion and just not mm -hmm. really think about it unless i was like, or go like 100 percent the other way which was um to immerse myself totally and not like kind of half-ass it uh yeah. because it's it, you know talking about this stuff all this stuff is like it's really complicated to make money in a in a really effective way unless you like really know your shit. Yeah. uh and you could capture like quite a bit of value by doing some basics and not really mm -hmm. investing much time. That was my personal yeah. approach towards crypto as investing. What advice would you be giving to um, people that are interested in crypto and want to try to make money from it? And uh, it, I mean, well, really that simple, especially poker players and a lot of my audience. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd recommend if you knew very little about crypto, um, if, if you figure out what percentage of your entire bankroll, your entire net worth you want to allocate into crypto, and then do something called dollar cost average. So, so if you figure out the, the most effective way to uh, buy crypto um, in order to, to, to hit your thresholds. So like the idea is basically, well, let's, let's say you have no crypto now and you want to hold like 5% of your uh, portfolio in crypto. You, sh you shouldn't necessarily just go out and, and like market buy um, all, the entire 5% at once. But like so, so, uh, maybe basically like the strategy you should use is just slowly buy over time. If, if, the, if, if the markets tank quite a bit, buy, buy, some, uh, but buy some more. If the markets go up quite a bit, maybe don't buy as much or like sell um, any time. Like a little, uh, for for example, if 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 you dollar cost your average in like let's say over the course of six months, and and you, you get to that five five percent ratio of your uh, of your entire net worth in the crypto, if crypto goes in a bull run, and um, it, it becomes like seven eight percent, and like your initial thesis was I want to hold five percent of my net worth in crypto, well then now it's like a logical time to to sell some to to reduce that ratio. Uh, I feel like that the, the biggest problem with people um, is that they get a bit greedy and then the, they don't take profits on, on their investments or on their positions, and um, they the, they get a bit emotional and a bit fearful when they lose money. So the the the, the logical thing to do is. To, to buy your assets when they're at a lower price, sell them when they're at a higher price. But like the emotional side of things is like if you lose a ton of money and it looks like the coin's going down, you want to sell before you you uh, you lose any more. And then if if something just like 
the rocket shipping to the moon, you, you don't want to jump off the rocket ship. You, <laughs> you want to go to the moon, you know. So it, it, it's 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 like an emotional thing that that people do, but I feel like that's the incorrect way to to approach investing in crypto. Uh, the, the the other thing I would recommend is to learn a decent amount about, like you mentioned it before, learn a decent amount about self-custody and crypto security. Because like one of the biggest problems with, with people today is that the, the, they don't know how to store their coins. Um, a lot of them aren't really technologically advanced. And one of the big issues with crypto right now is that there aren't very good uh, custody solutions, meaning it, it's one of the reasons why the like, major institutions, family offices, like large, large investment funds aren't really putting funds, um, substantial funds at least into crypto is because of the security risks where if you hold an asset like on a brokerage or like in a bank, it, it, you need no technical knowledge and you, you, your assets are, are safe. So like, I, I feel like eventually there's gonna be custody solutions that allow even like the dumbest people that can't even use a computer to be able to, to hold crypto. But, but until then, if you wanna get into crypto, like the, the first thing I would research is like how to hold your own, own coins, how to be secure, how to use two-factor authentication, how to s safely uh, secure your, your seed phrase, stuff like that. So like the, 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 the worst thing that can happen in crypto is if you make like, like decent investments, good positions, and then you don't take care of your, your coins and you have some security breach and you lose all your coins. And I, I, I see that happening quite a bit these days. Uh, yeah, that's a major issue. I mean, this is one of the reasons why I realized in my head, holy shit, I don't value security enough. And, you mm -hmm. know, I'm still, you know, having these kinds of, I mean, I basically devised ways short term to reduce these kinds of risks. But I realized in my head more and more, like, you know, security is really important. And it's like, mm -hmm. not the most fun topic in the world. You don't when you're thinking of sexy topics or hot topics, you don't think, oh, yeah, I'm really uh, into, you know, let's, let's like save my money and make sure it's Protect it. Yeah. <laughs> let's like you know. Let's like uh, get the two FA. Yeah, hot stuff. Yeah. Um, it's not um usually <laughs> top of the interest kind of list, but it is super important. It's really important yeah. to uh, reduce those like tail risks kind of situations, um, and not get for massive amounts. Um, ideally, I mean, there's a number of those. Like full tilt actually was an example one. I mean, you want to have distributed assets and that sort of thing. I'm actually getting some crypto in my eyes is a way of doing that because there's a really high chance of like economic market crash of some sort with uh, fiat currencies and stuff like that. I'm not even an expert, but it just seems like there's all these like potential for high volatility situations and just like who knows what the f will happen in the future. Um, yeah. And it's really important to be protected. I mean, that's why I personally thought gold, getting some gold all of a sudden was a good idea. I mean, yeah. as you said, it's not really, it doesn't really solve the problem because it's not insured. Like you need yeah. to like straight up buy some fucking gold or go to Pax G. I think is, I think actually does. Um, yeah, a decent solution. Um, and I'm actually really surprised that there's no, you know, these uh these these things these institutions that secure funds for people that don't know what they're doing haven't made a solution for crypto because it doesn't seem that hard. Well, and the, 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 there are the, 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 there there are quite a, a few very good solutions. The, the the issue with them is they're very expensive. Oh. So, like there are like for example, a company called Fireblocks is is you know, uh, I, I think it's like the, the biggest company in terms of uh, institutional custody. That the problem is is like like. Uh, uh, I, I have a company that uses Firebox. We pay them forty thousand dollars a month, which is um, like we we, it, we we use it for for, for institutional storage and, and institutional transactions through decentralized finance and stuff like that. Um, but like e e even if it's like a thousand dollars a month, that that prices out maybe like ninety five to ninety eight percent of the population that want to invest in crypto because it's just like it, it, it's way too much to spend per month just to secure your assets so like a, a lot of the the good custody solutions are out there they're, they're all just like institutional grade and they're targeting you know like big funds with like hundred hundred millions no. of dollars under management and they sort of exclude the the individual end user what about um i've heard of this one um called unchained it looked really cheap 
I contemplated using it, but for some reason I didn't. Um, have you heard Unchained. of this? Unchained. I don't think so. That one might be, you know, might target a lot of like you know, people who aren't super rich. Are you figuring it out right now? Uh, Bitcoin Financial uh, Unchained Capital. Yeah. Yeah, it, it looks like it's it's just a a Bitcoin storage. Uh, um, yeah, it it, it looks it looks decent. I, I've actually heard of this. I didn't realize it was it was called Unchained. Uh, I thought it was called something else. But uh, so, so like the, the the biggest issue now is that like now that Ethereum and other like layer one smart contract blockchains exist. Um, and it's not just Bitcoin. So B B Bitcoin is basically, like I call it a boomer asset. It's basically, the, the, there isn't much development on Bitcoin, that there is some, but like its main use case is either store value or like a, a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer cash, meaning you're just swapping, you're just holding your money, you're swapping it back and forth. So th th those custodial solutions uh, are, are pretty easy. If you just want to hit uh, hold Bitcoin and, and you want to like hold it in like a, a custody, it, it, the, that's pretty easy. But I, I, if you want to start doing stuff like like trading on chain, like buying synthetic assets, it, you know, like I, I, anytime like a new protocol or a, a new chain or new technology comes out and you want to be able to, to use that te technology, th then like the custody thing becomes a, a bit muddy for you because the, the the way that general Bitcoin custody works is you give your Bitcoin to someone else that the, they secure it for you and then w when you want it back they'll send it back to you but the the, the way custody needs to work is y you, you need to have access to your funds at real time if you want to like interact with markets if you want to use platform so it, it, it's why like stuff like fireblocks exist where, where people can have like a custody solution but then also you know like de deposit money in order to, to uh, as collateral in order to, in order to borrow assets or, or trade on an automated market maker they, they can do that within oh. the framework of the, uh, the the custodian oh okay that does seem a little bit more complicated